It's been a ridiculous week, if not year to date. But what I've noticed in my recent television flipping, not only from the Democratic National Convention, but especially with the Republican National Convention. Which started last night. We've only seen one. Don't worry, we'll see more. Yes, we will. Is it seems that everybody that spoke last night has what I consider histrionic personality disorder. Now, let me just tell you what a few of those symptoms are because they suffer from all of them. Somebody who has histrionic personality disorder is uncomfortable unless they are the center of attention, exhibit inappropriate behavior, shift emotions rapidly, act very dramatically as though performing before an audience with exaggerated emotions and expressions, yet appear to lack sincerity, are overly concerned with physical appearance, oh, his hair, the Cheeto King, constantly seek approval, are excessively sensitive to criticism or disapproval, have a low tolerance for frustration, are easily bored by routine, often beginning projects, or in his case, never reading anything, even if it's three pages long that comes to his desk, not thinking before acting, making rash decisions, they're self-centered and rarely show concern for others, have difficulty maintaining relationships, and we know, even according to his sister, the federal judge, and his niece, and almost everybody concerned with him, especially, I can't wait for Michael Cohen's book, he doesn't have any friends, and they will use all kinds of threats to get attention. Now, Tim, did I miss anything? I, you didn't, and, and there's so many things I want to talk about with this Republican convention, and, and I can connect it connect the thread with basically what you were the list you're just making what's amazing about that is the whole obsession with center of attention because the right wingers that are big republican trump fans had to watch cnn because cnn was the only one that showed in its entirety tucker carlson and those people would only show the best or these certain parts because they it was interrupting their shows so if you're actually a fox watcher you couldn't even really watch the whole thing because those guys are such, and Hannity, are such egomaniacs that they're really upset that there was, the attention was being taken away from them. Because I was flipping between all of them. You know, of course, we, 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 we are, and we're going to systematically talk about a lot of these characters and the way it was done. I'll, I'll step aside and I'm going to compare just quickly DNC, uh, the Democratic National Convention and this from a purely technical standpoint. Definitely the Republican one was a faster pace. He has the same uh, executive producer from The Apprentice, so it was definitely much more reality show. You, you know, I'm just thinking about who it's aimed towards. It was a faster pace. They had moments of cheers. You know, the, the thing about the Democratic one, the awkward silence was, you felt it the whole time. So they, they superimposed fake cheers. Um, of course, they took all these rando uh, shots of just hardworking Americans, a lot of times black. And I don't think... They got permission for that because it's like, huh? But th but those are just minor things that I can maybe compare it to that are maybe in the Republican favor. The Republicans kind of screwed up here because I you know this dystopian thing with the Democratic convention is like, oh, it's doom and gloom if you don't vote for us. A huge opportunity to miss for the Republicans. They did the same thing. They were saying it's going to be doom and gloom if you don't vote for us, and I don't think that's going to work. Well, the thing is, it is already doom and gloom. I loved when one of his idiot sons said. This election is all about church, which none of them have ever gone to, work, which none of them have ever had to do, and school. And we all know Trump, not that, well, smart enough to pay somebody to take his SAT. Well, according to his sister. And, and of course, the, the whole thing's about schools and being able to go what, to where you want. It's just a bunch of, again, right-wing privatization. And, and it's so, it's, the hip, hypocrisy is always really annoying with, with the Republicans. You know, they're like, oh, the unions are holding us back. It's like, except for police unions that you're completely supporting who are endorsing you, who just basically are allowed to murder. Um, just, by the way, murdered, hey, almost, no, they didn't murder, they paralyzed another black man with eight oh, wow. bullet holes in front of three of his kids, uh, who fortunately, uh, Jacob Blake, a GoFundMe, raised $900,000 in one day because he is going to be paralyzed for life. And, and then that we can, with who was featured last night and is kind of connected with it was, uh, was that kind of McMansion gun nut couple uh, <laughs> who were up there talking about their rights to defend. But, you know, and, you know, you can make arguments that someone has a right to defend themselves and all this stuff. And, you know, if you're into guns and you're not into the Republicans, you know, there's all these arguments. What they weren't seeing is basically St. Louis is an apartheid. It's basically they're living in what the gated, the white gated communities you see in Johannesburg to this day in South Africa. It's not so far removed to where they live in St. Louis, St. Louis being in the top 50 most dangerous cities in the world. They think 
oh, you know, these these basically black people are a threat and I should be able to defend myself. It's like you're in trouble when you're afraid of your own community. If you're afraid of your own neighbor, someone down the street, and they refuse to even look at the macro problem of the city of St. Louis, for instance, uh, which which is a, just a train wreck of a city. Well, I want to I want to talk about how they try to paint both Biden and Harris as being soft on crime. I want to bring a few points up about Kamala Harris because, uh, look, I don't like any of the people that are running, but the only thing I can say about the Democrats is we hope that they're going to listen to Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and a few other reasonable voices, and I think they will. But Kamala Harris, soft on crime, she declined to support two initiatives that would have banned the death penalty. First of all, we'll start yeah, there. Well. She also... Um, she had a she passed a law that truancy in schools that parents would be punished. Yes. Now truancy dropped, but still, I mean, this is a bit ridiculous. Also, also, I mean, uh, accomplish. You know, one of her accomplishments was though creating open justice and online platform to make criminal justice data available to the public to improve police accountability, but she still didn't address police brutality when she was attorney general. She didn't support a 2015 bill, 2015 bill in the state assembly that would have required the attorney general to appoint a special prosecutor who specializes in the police use of deadly force. And here is where we are today still. So they try to paint them as soft on crime, but actually she was harsh on crime. And, and, that, and that, this is a good segue into the long list of hard right wing, often war criminals that are endorsing Biden. And it, what's interesting about this is that the Democrats are painting this as see how rational we are. Even if these right wingers are supporting us, look how nuts Trump is. It's like, well, wait a second. Let's talk about this list. Let's talk about John Negroponte, uh, who's, who's endorsing it, who, who not only was very involved in uh, the Contra scandal in, I in Nicaragua, it, it just keeps on going on from there. Uh, he's very involved in the Iraq war. And then, of course, Obama. Uh, hey, do you want to be the ambassador of the Philippines? I mean, John Negroponte is a litigious genius. He's also <laughs> arguably a sadist. I mean, if you are that kind of war criminal, you basically have three results. You're going to be killed, you're going to be thrown in jail, or you're a made man. He's clearly a made man. Co uh, Colin Powell, another on the list. Michael Hayden, who used to be, of course, sp spied on us with the you know, director of the NSA. Uh, CIA, the interesting one this week, John Spencer, uh, uh, Richard Spencer, I'm sorry. John Spencer, whoa, whoa, whoa. Richard Spencer. The alt-right, the new wave of neo-fascism uh, in America, the fans, the, the guy with the Morrissey haircut, and, uh, oh. and and he wears a suit, and he's basically, he's anti-Semitic, he's racist, all this stuff. He's supporting Biden, and b based on the grounds of, well, the liberals are more are more uh, competent than the Trump administration, and it's not no longer our, we blew it. You know, we blew it. We have to come back to the drawing board. Uh, okay, you're, you're talking about high-level recruits from one side to the other because they realize the incompetence and danger that we face with even another four minutes of Trump, not to mention four years. I love that one of his idiotic supporters last night accidentally, because she's an idiot, in Hindi, trying to stimulate like votes away from Kamala oh. Harris, called him a jackass. Well, it's funny you bring this up, and I, I, you know, they're clearly going after these three demographics where Trump's numbers aren't going up. They're going after uh, suburban white housewives. It's not going to work. Uh, they're, they're going at, and Karl Rove brought this up because he's, he's a master of um, demographics in terms of political strategy, whether you like him, I hate him. Um, but he says, well, basically, if, if the Repu every one vote, a black vote, the Republicans can steal from the Democrats, that's two votes because the Democrats lose one, they gain two. And with GW, between the first time he's elected and the second time he's elected, he went from 8% of the black vote, which is <laughs> very telling, to 16% of the vote, which is still very small. But it was a huge difference. And so they were clearly courting the black vote, especially they, their favorite new is this new girl, Kim Classic, who's running for something of, of Baltimore. And, and so they keep on haranguing about have the Democrats treated you well? Have they treated and if they and, and, and the argument, even though it's just outrageous, is if the Republicans are a solution to Black America. But if they can just change a few minds, it can make a huge difference. Really, kind of well, embarrassing and, to wait, watch. Wait, it. Let me just interject for a minute. They're really underestimating the intelligence of the average Black American by thinking they're going to be swayed by this bullshit. Because if there's one thing that most 
people that have struggled in their life know. They know bullshit when they see it. <laughs> well, all right. So I want to compare another thing before we kind of maybe move away from all this. Maybe we have a few uh, more things in there. Got the post office yeah, yeah. But, but we have we have a lot of things that we can hopefully get in. Obviously, both the Democratic uh, convention and the Republican wanted to show grab regular Americans that were not celebrities or uh, po career politicians and ta and have them speak. So basically, the the DNC picked these kind of humorless NPR, plain Jane, good goodies up there who just did virtue signaling and it was totally embarrassing to watch. And then the Republicans basically picked the dumbest fucking shitheads you've ever seen on the planet. Just like, I'm dumb. And, and guess what? My town doesn't have public transportation. It has nothing. And I'm just, that's why I'm a good person. Like, well, it has no public transportation because you vote for the dumbest things on the fucking planet and you're not into taxes because uh, that's taking away my ability to buy more cheeseburgers at fucking Wendy's. And and basically, it's like, well, guess, guess what? You have no fucking bus. You have none of that, you moron. Well, they're also underestimating the vote of the American farmer who realize, look, hard enough to be a farmer. I'm talking about independent farmers who have been raped by the Trump administration lies. So he's losing a big sector of that after his, uh, you know, first sucking China's dick and then accusing them of being the evil of all the planet. I like that it was just uh, today that both New York and New Jersey decided to sue Trump and DeJoy, if ever a man was named inappropriately, about their postal perversion. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I... I Hey, so, so you know what thing that still really bothers me? And it's pretty much in this trap, abstract. The elephant versus the donkey. I mean, the, the elephant's kind of a more powerful, more intelligent animal. I'm always mad. At, what, what's the history? Why, why the fucking... Why do the Democrats always choose the donkey as their, or why is that? Why is that? It always infuriated me. I mean, I had good donkey raviolis in Italy once, but that's that's. Hey, as much hey, as I hey! Want. Don't knock the donkey. <laughs> Donkeys though are loyal. They're humble okay. and they work hard. Oh. I'm not against the donkey. All right, all right. Elephants are great painters, and they have a great memory. They have great memory. <laughs> well, so, so, so before Back to we... the post office for a minute. Please. Getting rid of these sorting machines, and then the idiot has the nerve to even announce he's not going to reinstate them. That's why they're being sued. It takes one hour on a sorting machine to sort, to, to sort 30,000 pieces of mail. It would take 30 workers a day to sort the same amount. Now, we know this is a ploy by Trump who put in one of his cronies, a big contributor, and then he gives DeJoy's wife a position to be an ambassador to Canada. Uh, this job, which he knows nothing about, and is just fucking a system that was actually the post office, part of the Constitution. You're really not allowed to fuck with it. So New York and New Jersey suing, but how many times has this fucking cunt been sued, and when is it going to matter? And the only reason he wants to be elected again and then yet again is because he knows he's going to face some hardcore prison time, and I think that Ivanka would also look really good in orange. Well, there's, so, so, so nice, nice one. I, so their strategy of the post office is basically just constantly cause chaos, so, so it breaks down anyone's confidence in the system. Because if Trump doesn't win, it's uh, fraudulent. I mean, the, this is yeah, how, well, back to his frantic personality disorder. Now, let's talk about another egotistical asshole, a big supporter of Trump, who finally and has to resign from one of these bogus, the Liberty University, oh my, uh, oh Falwell Jr. It was a cuckold, now, it turns out. Yeah, Falwell <laughs> Jr., as if a few weeks ago in a picture of him with his pants unzipped, putting his arm around some floozy redhead, wasn't bad enough. Finally, the pool boy, quote unquote, comes out and says that for years- I think it was 20 years. Fucking Falwell's wife. Is and there another guy too? I think that he, We'll start with the pool guy. And Falwell would be watching in his speed. The pool guy became the business guy or are those two different people? His business assistant- I was confused. It's, no, it's one of the He same. likes to watch his wife get- Pumped and uh, and you know if that's what he's into, but but, but you know I, who cares? It's more about the fucking hypocrisy and the shit that he preaches, which is basically well. Excuse me, where is there more perversion than in the Catholic Church? And if you think the evangelicals are far behind, they're not. But it's not only for that reason that fall well moral majority really immoral. Again, people saying the opposite of what they really are, the immoral majority. I mean, one of the underlings at the at the uh, Liberty University said, "We're not a school. We're a real estate hedge fund. We're not educating. We're buying real estate every year and taking students' money to do it." And that this standard of conduct that they expect from conservative Christians uh, 
is not happening because there's partying, nightclubs, graphically describing, uh, that is, Falwell Jr.'s sex life, right. uh, and, and a series of other atrocities that just go on. And, of course, this is one of the biggest supporters and defenders because the only Christians or evangelicals that are come to, going to come to Trump, the most irreligious man ever, his defense, are those that are probably as perverted as he is. Well, in the, in the article, the interview you sent me, this week with Cornell West was great because he talks about this. His issue with the Democrat, um, what do you call it? The, Possibility. Uh, the, no, the, the, the Democratic Party, the, the, the establishment, is the moral inconsistency. And 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 when Obama asked him to join his team, he said, "Well, we can't talk about these things when you're bringing in these Wall Street." And Pentagon military guys the beige puppet and, and, Barack as, Obama. as your advice, because Too bad. these are these Blew are it. these are huge problems that they cannot coexist with with everything that you are claiming is justice, which I call, and, and, and he basically says, you know, Democratic Party and Republican Party. He calls basically what runs it the corporate confederacy. And if you want to talk about a modern confederacy, there we go. It's, it's, it's that element of these parties. Absolutely. They're all millionaires in Congress or Senate. Billionaires. Oh, yeah. Or billionaires. <laughs> and again, Cornell West, please read up. The only two people I would care to vote for, and yes, every vote counts. If only it really fucking did. I'm not sure it does, but still, you got to fucking do it this time. I'd like to see Cornell West and Jesse Ventura. Yes, that, that would be an interesting on one. the bill. I, well, I mean, this would be the last thing about the convention last night. Of course, the one, the big one they're all talking about is Kimberly. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Balfour. Yes, and, and and I didn't realize this until because of course she was going nuts. She was really selling it hard. Well, she was married. To, that, she was married to Gavin Newsom. I well, didn't know there that. There was reports that both her and one of the sons were on were highly coked up. But why wouldn't they be with all that money? Well, you know. God, God. I, you right, know, on, a, on a lighter note, yes. I, I have a few more lighter notes, but I, there's a few darker notes along the way on the way. If you well, want let's them. get them over with. Go ahead. All right. Throw well, them out at well, me. I, I, maybe it's a lighter note that the Con uh, Kelly and Conway's family is well, no, no, breaking apart. Excuse at, me. <laughs> Claudia like, Conway, hero of the, the week, fifteen year old, fifteen year old TikTok superstar, getting her mother after you know finally to stop sucking Trump's dick and getting her out of the fucking White House because nobody wants to see that washed up raggedy ass blonde again. And supposedly George Conway, too, is stepping aside. But you know what? He's already done so much good work with the Lincoln Project, and they will go on. Michael Steele just joined the, oh, the Lincoln Project. Uh, carry on. So Trump's major speech might be disrupted by uh, Hurricane Laura. Uh, <laughs> where, you know, so you have, you have this two drop. Well, well, the first one was, I don't think it was fine, uh, technically a hurricane when it was. It hit no, it, short. It, but, right. but, but Hurricane Laura is basically gunning across the... Um, and rarely is there two hurricanes back and, to oh, back. Oh, this is super rare. rare. And, and it's going right towards Louisiana, which 15 years ago, right this Katrina. week, was Katrina. The Gulf of Mexico right now, the heart of it, the temperature, it, the water is 90 degrees. So for the, all you out there who don't know about hurricanes, warm water, water. Warm, water. Wa warm water is rocket fuel on a storm. Yeah. So that's why it's like, oh, it's, uh, it's a Category 1, Category 2. No, it doesn't go down in strength. It goes up once it, cross, it crosses that warm water. So. We're going to see what's going to happen. So, and of course, you have the fires are going crazy in California. Well, it's, in California, it's been uh, the fires, about 12,000 lightning strikes started yeah. a lot oh, of these. It, it, unheard of in three days. Unheard of. Worst air quality in the world. The size of three Los Angeles have burned. And th but this is where this is catastrophic. So this is where it's going to be kind of interesting with Trump because oh. so, so Hurricane Laura might really hit the big impact might be on Thursday when his big speech is supposed to happen. Um, if only it would blow but, that but, blowhard but, but away. Here's the, this is what the Republicans' plan is. You know, the, the federal uh, FEMA money that was going to everyone, the $600 a week, of course, they're bringing it down to 400 and they're trying to tap into the FEMA uh, budget. Well, And they could and, have gone after the money they never paid Puerto Rico that they said they were going to, which happens yeah, to be well, an American territory. That is racist. But, but uh, Unbelievable. Yeah, so so this will be interesting. It might be, this storm might actually be a perfect storm. I, well, no, it, because it's not hitting wherever Trump's standing. Well, well, not perfect. Well, me. so so, but, but it, it would be a huge disaster if suddenly, oh, the, our big plan. There is no money because FEMA needs it all for these the, this hurricane disaster, these these fires, blah 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 blah. Solomon, the 150 pound African sulcata tortoise, that's a pet, to the Cole family in Tennessee, disappeared. 
you know, they, they're one of these exotic animal collectors. They had it all fenced off, and this thing's probably moving half a mile an hour, and and it just gone, and it was gone for seventy four days. They got it back and uh, found its it, way back. Uh, no, I think they were driving like there's Solomon, <laughs> and uh, they picked it up. It didn't really give a shit one way or the other. It brought the fucking thing back, but it's back safe and sound. But it was well. There's nothing. It's not in its indigenous. Uh, it's in a mile from where he left. Yeah, it, it, it's le- it's not as an indigenous grass. So I don't know if there's any. It's not looking for other tourists to hump. Probably is, but they don't. They're not right, there. What about, what about the kids? What about the teenagers that broke into the petting zoo and then left a lipstick mark on a donkey donkey's forehead? No questions asked. Thank you very much. I myself. Do like the miniature donkeys? I'm just saying. Oh, they're 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 cute. They're it cute. It wasn't. I'm I'm telling you, it was not my lipstick. So, on, in other good news, 16 year old <laughs> Ivan Zaborski um, has come out of his coma uh, after he was in soccer, his high school soccer practice, and and for anyone that's out there, you gotta look this footage up. Blasted by a lightning bolt in the middle of uh, in the middle of practice. I mean, just like wham, and it's all on camera. And he was in a coma for a couple weeks, but he's back and he's practicing again. And he doesn't remember a thing. That's his quote. I don't remember any of it. Uh, but he was, they, they fucking, <laughs> he got whacked. And I mean, so that's what I'm worried about. He wants to go back. So the, the word is once you get hit by lightning once, there's some kind of field. It might they, happen they, they, again. Well, the, the world record, Roy Sullivan was struck by seven t- start lightning seven times. Um, he, in fact, he, he got a divorce because his wife was struck once. And, and the, the one of this, he got so used to it. He was driving home from work one day and he's like that cloud, that cloud right there. It's following me. And everyone's like, what it. the hell are you talking about? And it was like out of like Warner brothers, Looney Tunes. He's like running from his car to his, his front door and on his front yard, bam, he gets hit. Happened. It's actually, well, it's he made it into the Ripley's believe it or not, or the Guinness yes, book did. of world records. All right. Speaking about the Guinness book of world records, Bibby Hansen. Ooh. Youngest Warhol superstar, age 14, out, out of truant school, does a short clip for Warhol, dances with the Velvet Underground, stays in New York for a while, goes out to L.A., starts a punk rock coffee shop, has, starts performing, has a kid called Beck, we'll go into that, and I met her when I was doing uh, the Unhappy Hour in Los Angeles, a series of performances that Ron Athey invited me to contact Bibby for. And she's going to tell her story right now. This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and our special guest, Bibby Hansen. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl, and today our very special guest, Bibby Hansen. Bibby is a creative force of nature. With a dad like Al Hansen, one of the leaders of Fluxus, and a bohemian poet dancer mom, she was sure to do something, or basically it seemed like everything, in the creative arts. I met Bibby through Ron Athey, one of our other fabulous podcast when I was doing the unhappy hour in Los Angeles. And I think Bibby, although she had done so many other forms of art before, had never really done spoken word. She was invited. I was devastated and blown away. 18 years later, we've done a lot of performance together and various workshops and presentations. But we're going to go back to the beginning because if somebody could have played your life, only you could have. (laughs) Think Tatum O'Neill at 10, only a bigger, or should I say a smaller, but hotter badass. Welcome, Bibby. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. It's so good just to have an excuse to hang out with you guys. I miss you all. Let's go back to the beginning. And actually, before the beginning, let's go to the present. How is that for time travel? (laughs) Bibby's going to read a poem. I know her more for her memoirs, but I can't wait. So, Bibby, throw down, babe. Okay, I'm going to read a poem about a guy named Freddie Herco. It's one of my series of poems for people I knew back in the day from the factory in downtown New York. Freddie was an experimental avant-garde 
dancer and with Diane de Prima, my dad and some others, he started, he, he helped found the New York Poets Theater and the Judson Performance Group. And he was a regular performer with me and my dad's happenings. And like so many other great bright lights of that era, Freddie fell under the spell of drugs and became utterly unbalanced. At one point, he announced a rooftop suicide performance, but nobody came. And a few days later, he sought a momentary refuge at his old lover, Johnny Dodd's place. And up in Johnny's Cornelia Street uh, studio, Freddie poured a bottle of perfume in a bath and bathed and then naked, he danced beautifully to Mozart's coronation mass. And at the crescendo of the sanctum, he performed a flawless grand jeté out the fifth story window to his death in the street below. The first poem I'm, I'm gonna read is, is, is for Freddie. The needle leapt into the jukebox record or your vein. A grand jeté rushed to the psyche. We smoked pot in the femme john at the Russian tea room and tea heed he and I, tea in the red tea room. Our heads swimming, the night shimmering, wiping your puke mouth and the sweat from your brow, helping you pee straight. I knew what to do to see him through. Panhandle money for a bottle of cough. Codeine, turpin, hydrate could be had. Those were our ways back in good, bad, old fashioned days before methadone or oxys. We sat side by side in the summer park darkness passing a cigarette and the bottle of cough, while in the tree above us, a bird trilled the lonely unanswered invitation, an echo to your sadness. Heart children, we went running while walking wild in the pre-dawn back alleyways, laughing in spite of everything. And the clock tower smiled and chimed our time together through the streets of fire to that shooting star spirit endpoint a deja vu dream of your tour jeté, spinning, grinning through the slip song night, a split air dance chance right on cue, meant only for you. You could be unkind, but never were untrue. Thank you so much. So how old were you when you knew Freddie, Bibby? I was uh, on the Lower East Side about 12 and 13. He was a dancer with the Judson Troop Dance Group and Janet Kerouac and Diane DePrima's little daughter, Jeannie DePrima, and I all took dance classes from some of the dancers from Judson Church Dance Group. And by by were, the way, Diane DePrima, which people might not know, she was one of the only female beats who got any attention and actually published the only Herbert Hunky book was published by Anne de Prima. And that was part of your, you were hanging out with the Beats and the daughter of the Beats when you're 12 and recording with Jack Kerouac's daughter, Janet. Yeah, amazing. Tell me a little bit more about this because by 12 you were already doing Fluxus performances with your dad, Al Hansen. You were well, actually Fluxus doesn't come around for another eight, eight or nine years or so, but you are actually dead on because most of what later claimed to be Fluxus was already going on. Right. And happening without that name, without George Machina, okay, without exactly. any of that. All the people that later would do it were all doing it back then in, in New York. Down without there. necessarily the name. Because I remember you telling me about a performance you did at 10 with a bag of glasses and a hammer. And dad <laughs> said, Go ahead. That's my kind of performance art. Yeah, yeah. Permission to destroy. Awesome. Yeah, amazing. I mean, who gives a, a, a little kid, you know, a hammer and a box and a, and a stack of bottles and says, smash these like one or two at a time. No goggles, no clothes. No. <laughs> Just go at it. So it's one of your new projects poems to the dead? Well, you know, poems in general, because I have one section particularly called factory poems, which has to do with all the people 
that come in and out of that. And some of them are still alive and thriving. You were the youngest Warhol superstar at 14, fresh out of reform school. Right, right. Amazing times. From that, that led to Dancing with the Velvet Underground. Yeah, well, that, that just happened to be like one of those crazy things. I ran into Gerard someplace and he said, oh, we're doing this experimental performance happening thing at the Cinematheque tonight, which was Jonas Mikas' uh, place where he was showing av- underground and avant-garde films. Some of which you were in. Yes. And he said, and it's like a multimedia, like everything going on at once. It would be great if you could come and dance. And so it was about the second public performance. Films were being projected. Uh, The Velvet Underground were at the back of the stage, sort of under and behind and around the screen, almost in the dark, playing music. The one I remember, Venus of Furs, was one of the songs that we danced to. And Gerard was there, and this might have been one of the only ones where Edie actually danced, I believe. It was either Edie, it might have been Mary, but I don't think Mary was even there yet, because Mary wasn't there while Edie was there. Mary Warrenov and Edie Sedgwick. Yeah, and we danced. My girlfriend Eileen and I and Gerard and, and maybe one other people, we were in the front doing dancing, and they were spraying film all over us in the dark, flickering. <laughs> The Velvets were playing and it was it was a lot of fun. And afterwards, Edie and Eileen and I went to Arthur, <laughs> the nightclub owned by, uh, oh gosh, what was her name? Burton, Sybil Burton, uh, the ex of uh, Richard Burton. And it was the, okay. uh, you know, uptown hangouts, nightlife, great places. But that was an insane place to be at 14 or 15, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. But when did the Arthur end? Well, what, what was that about? Arthur, well, it's just there was a bunch of nightclubs that we would go to. Edie and I went to quite a few together. I, I was way underage, so I right. was into them. But, for instance, an, a, another favorite place to hang out was a place called Steve Paul's The Scene. Was that in the village? Yeah, uh, well, it was uh, uptown, it was uptown a little bit. And they... They would go in and somebody would sneak me in the back door and and Steve Paul would spot me and throw me out for being underage. And then I'd go back around to the back door and somebody would pull me in and I'd dance a bit and try and stay in the shadows and and then get thrown out again and rinse, you know, shampoo, rinse, repeat. So, Billy, let me ask you, I mean, your dad was obviously encouraging you to be taking risks and encouraging you to kind of express yourself in maybe this kind of avant-garde or rogue fa- fashion, yet at the same time... Yeah, counterintuitive, right? He, he was also kind of a disciplinarian. He was also kind of strict as yeah. well. So yeah. how did you interpret that? And how did you uh, filter that, the whole thing, as a teenage girl? Well, it's kind of the opposite like to the story of going to Steve Falls the scene with Andy Warhol, where he'd sneak me in the back and Steve would throw me out the front and I'd go around the back... <laughs> Well, my dad would take me to school, put me in the front door, go around to the back where I'd be coming out the back, (laughs) grabbing the roof of the neck, take me around to the front, put me back into the school. And and we'd do that for a few hours until he realized that he'd have to guard the school. If he wanted to keep you in there. You had a real Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde experience. You had your daytime going in the front, leaving out the back school experience and in your nighttime entering the back and leaving the front. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, yeah, somewhere in there. It's a lot of oppositional sort of conflicting. Right, because your dad was uh, encouraging. He was also showing you alternative perspectives uh, of just lifestyle, Absolutely. Uh, vision, just the whole thing. Yes. And yet at the same time, he's like, you got to go to school. You got to do this stuff. So yeah. Total crook and a pirate, and I don't know what the hell he was thinking, but arguably neither of my parents were very competent as parents. Primarily. Okay. They were lovely human beings. I adored them both. I fault them nothing, and uh, but parenting wasn't wasn't a strong suit and with so either we, of them. I'm grateful for the gifts I got. I got well, there you go. Well, by, by 14, really, the streets, the beats... The factory, 
this was your family and your friends. This was yeah. raising you. As well as the whole underground uh, art scene from downtown that would later become Flexus. That was at the time the happenings, Neo Dada, uh, DIY crazy people there who were all influenced by going to John Cage's class at the School of Social Research in the late 50s and, and from Duchamp being yeah. around and active in New York City at, at that time. Did you ever meet Duchamp? No, I didn't. My dad did. Okay. Created my favorite piece of art, Eitan Donet. I mean, what, I, what I've read about that is everyone wanted to be around him and everyone was almost impersonating him to a degree. And uh, I don't know if that's true, but he was just that magnetic as a uh, personality. Um, that's what I've read. He's very important to, to everything that comes after. Totally, the, totally. The, the stuff we do in music, the stuff we do in writing, uh, so much of what happened in art that that autonomy and stuff that was all about him breaking the rules. There were a lot of drugs around in that period, maybe when you're yeah. very young. Um, <laughs> were you imbibing? Um, how did you avoid ending up what could have been a disaster in the gutter? I have no idea. Did you feel like you had to parent some of these people that were older than you? Oh, I, I yeah. was for sure my mother's parent. Absolutely my mother's parent. My father and I were just, I don't know, simultaneous planets in the in uh, similar orbits somewhere in the universe. But my mother was uh, very fragile, very broken and screwed up. Almost anybody who's had an alcoholic or drug addicted or mentally disturbed parent has the same story. Gifts, I'm sorry, you have siblings or you only child? I, I don't know this. I had a half sister, but I didn't meet her till after my mother died. She was my mother's okay. daughter. So, wasn't. were you making breakfast for your mother? I mean, was it like that? Was she like sleeping till noon and speed freaks and junkies? There's no breakfast. I mean, there's no, there's no toilet paper. Okay, okay. <laughs> Did you have anger towards this? Never. Okay. Well, you were pretty much a wild child. What? else did you know? You only know what you know at that age and what you're picking up from other people. And, you know, you're both liberated and also confined by the inadequacies of the people that should be helping you sort this shit out. Well, um, I, it, it's interesting because I had a lot of ups and downs in my, in my life financially and in terms of locations there was a short period of time when my mother married her I think her third husband and they had a, a bit of money and were living well for a very short time but you know with their normal chaos and I remember a few years later being on the Lower East Side with my mother and I sharing a pair of sneakers that had holes in them and it was winter and we had to take turns going out. And I remembered only a few years before, just me being a very small girl and my closet in my room with about 14 or 15 pairs of shoes in it. And, uh, and, and then sort of contemplating like, huh, this is different. I have holy sneakers and I share them with my mother that same day, I took off with the sneakers and left her stranded in a shooting gallery. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, and I've always felt a little guilty about that. Well, I mean, uh, I don't see why. She's the one that should have the guilt. Hey, how about another poem for the dead? Okay. This is one that I wrote kind of based upon, like, stuff that's more happening now. Please do. Which we could call it Poem for the Dying. Once they scraped the sky, now they escape our sighs. As the long shadows of the dead city make dank, cold tombs of side street sidewalks. In the same way, their infernal, internal, dark shadows thrust out to us from the Apache party in the capital, piratical, and froze close the country's hearts as they strip mined the minds of the lost and filled them with all manner of polluted contaminants and noxious non-now ideas, wrapped up in gaudy tinsel with dago pictures 
of the love and suffering of Christ our Lord of fuck you. This all right day and night mighty clown white rhetoric tore down and defamed our love carnival and kicked it out of town. Stragglers were arrested as oh so pretty vacant vagrants. No Soho to go though. So now we park our trailer in the sunset hours by the liar's towers and dance naked in the fields across the street from the inn of no redress. Thank you so much. Now let's talk a little bit about your spoken word history. So child actress, child troublemaker, doing performances at a very early age, hanging out with Beats, being filmed by Warhol at 14, hanging out with the factory, dancing with the Velvet Underground. That's all New York. When did you go to LA then? What made you go to LA? Huh. You know, everybody asked me why I wasn't in the Chelsea Girls, and it's because I went back to jail. <laughs> oh, do tell. And like you do. And while I was there, my mother died. I had less and less reason to be there and uh, decided I had had enough of institutional life and was ready to start for real on my own. So I ran away and I went to the Caribbean for a while until I turned 18 and could be back in the States with nobody knowing, you know, assumed name, dyed my hair black and disappeared until I was 18 and then came back to New York. And in New York, I was kind of burned down on New York. It was cold. And I had just spent months and months in the Caribbean with the, the sun and the ocean. And I just said, yeah, I'm kind of done with this. So I thought, well, LA has got warm weather and I know a couple of people out there maybe they have movies out there maybe there's something I could do out there so off I went so uh, how long were you in jail before you went to the Caribbean God, maybe 18 months what for that time um you know I don't even I, I don't even know when you have a kid like me when you have people like us if you don't have support, like either if you're not self-supporting and you don't have your own system and your own community and your own setup and your own life to live, or if you don't have parents or people who are taking care of you uh, and, and have got your back, if, you don't, if you're not old enough to have your own back and you've got nobody else having your own back, yeah. and you're, you're, you're wild, you're I was called an incorrigible. And look, what are, you, what are you supposed to do to support yourself as a teenager without guidance in New York City in the 60s, early 70s? We all had, there, there was only crime. That's how that only works. Crime. The thing is, is I was already on the radar. Like I was already on probation. I was already on parole because I'd been to jail. I got out, I had to dot the I's and cross the T's. And when I stopped showing up at the social workers and I stopped showing up at the probation officers, and I stopped showing up at the shrink and I stopped showing up at, you know, uh, school or any of the things I was supposed to be doing, they, they're then going around to my father, who now has custody of me after the last escapade, and they're saying, okay, so where the hell is she? You know, you said you'd have your eye, and he'd say, he'd say I don't know. So then I'm fair, then I'm fair game. You no, see, I'm right. the system. And, and that's how they do. You know, that's how they get us. But you've had a lot of female madness in your family. And then also in working with, actually the Beats might have been the saner women than the Warhol Factory, punk rock, and the other, the other you know, art forms and formats that you participated in. You came from a family of damaged women. And for and of course, the damage it doesn't begin with mom and it doesn't and we hope it to end with us. And that's what was so interesting to me about you. 
who had been artistically blocked for a while, probably while raising children, who you raised three very creative children, but then you came and gave the gift of giving people back to themselves. Yeah, well, that's what it is, isn't it? Find the most uh, essential, authentic self, apart from all the crap that's either been programmed into us by well-wishers <laughs> or, uh, or smacked into us with trauma. Or beaten out of us by neglect and selfishness of other people. I mean, there's a thousand ways it happens and, and there's no one way and there's no degree or whatever, but to whatever way it is, we sort of get adulterated and permeated with a bunch of stuff that isn't actually even ours. And when it is ours, isn't necessarily an invited guest or even part essential to what we, who we are and what we really want to do. In spite of the mania <laughs> of our lives, we are two of the most incredibly positive people I know. <laughs> who would have figured, right? Go figure. Go figure. We are two of the most, po two of the absolutely most positive people I know. Did you consciously want to be something different than what you witnessed adults being when you were a child? No, in a lot of ways, I, I, I probably wanted to be them. <laughs> I mean, they were great people. They were, fun, really, right? <laughs> they were really smart, funny, talented, dynamic, interesting, charming. And so are you, and you're alive, and you're carrying on. And, and I wonder if they were happy, because you are positive and kind of happy yeah uh to say um a, a lot of that uh a lot of what makes us i think uh unhappy is the stories you know we choose to tell well i we're think creative you know well, creative. wait a second i want to say what makes a lot of people unhappy is that they can't tell the story they need to tell to get it out of them now Let's talk about what also brought us together is I invited you to do a spoken word reading. You had done all kinds of performances and I didn't know you'd never done one. And I was amazed that was your first one. And since that 18 years ago, how fat is the memoir now? Oh man, it is so big. I mean, I, you, you really, in your own delightful way, bullied me into writing, which is my favorite, like one of my favorite things I ever did in my life. And I really enjoy that. I'm incredibly grateful to you for that and helping me to find that part of my voice, which um, I had when I was a kid. I used to write a lot when I was young. And it was a, a lifeline for me. And somewhere in there, I just dropped all that. I, I think it's a thing that happens somewhere between uh, being an older teenager and being a wife and a mother and all that stuff. You, you kind of lose a bit of vision in there sometimes, especially if you don't have any role models for any of that crap. You don't even have a clue how, how, to, how to do any of it. It can be a bit overwhelming. Well, the thing is, look, your story is not only amazing, you're a fantastic writer. These are stories people want to hear. You're a great example. And again, we need to have women's stories told. And especially women that have lived through a variety of different cultural manias, art processes, formats. And here we go. Well, the thing is, Lydia, honestly, I just live in such admiration and gratitude to you. One of the things that I think is so important about the work that you take on and that you do with such enthusiasm and, and so vigorously is to gather together <laughs> across the world a large variety of women's voices. We have all these men's voices and then they get together and they they have some kind of convening and they bring in one woman who is the woman's view <laughs> the woman's voice you know like there's one 
and what you do that is to knock the hell out of that and say, here's a wide variety and they don't agree and they are, they can be in conflict and they can be this or that or anything under the sun, but, but here's a bunch of them. It's without limitation. Now, where are we going with that 800 page memoir? <laughs> well, I'm actually working on something with it right now, which, it, you know, I mean, yeah. Okay, look, you had you lived it, then you wrote it. Did you feel relief? Because it is a huge body of work you've accomplished, my friend. And I know you often go back in, but is there an unburdening? Is there a relief? Or is it also as well, you have to give these poems and these stories of the dead. Somebody has to tell them. Yeah, well, you know, again, it's there's a Proustian element to it the past regain. There's this thing that happens, we go through life, we have these experiences, and we move on, and then we remember them back, but we're remembering and we're seeing them through the eyes of the person we've become. And there's something in the creative work that I do when I'm working with it, where I go back into that time and into that point of view, and tell that story as it happened with as much truth and as little space between me and that time and that story. I, I channel that, that 13, 14 year old self and have her tell the story and in, in her words, in her experience, which is the difference between the typical sort of memoir writing. So it almost becomes a, a novel in a way now. I mean. When I'm happy, when it's done, when it's all standing together, I will publish it. One of the things I'm doing is taking a couple of the stories together and doing a full-on performance of them as a one-woman show, no reading, spoken, performed with, with uh, projections, sound, lights. I, I think I'm going to premiere one of them or part of it this uh, first week of September up here in Hudson at something called the Hudson Eye, which is an arts festival that takes place. Do you want to pull out another one of those poems for us right now? Sure thing. Thank you, baby. Well, let's see. Edie Sedgwick. Please. Oh, Edie Sedgwick. There's always been in every age, in every era, that special person who's blessed with extraordinary charm and lit from within with this special grace, this abundance of grace. Edie came to Andy Warhol. They came together and she's said to be his muse for that period of time in the Silver Factory. But I think he was also hers. Edie and I actually shared quite a bit in common. She was, for me, that drug-addicted, sex-freamed, speed-freak, older sister I always longed for, and it was love at first sight. Anyway, um, I wrote a, a poem to commemorate her birthday. What would have been her birthday this year? Edie. Before we went into that midtown midnight, and our go-go dancing boots tapped on tiptoe off to Buffalo. Mine were shoe polished white with a fake courage dress. You wore silver with a white mini. We chased one another down the sidewalks, through the columns and into the phone booth. Across from the scene, we hooked into the universal party line that connected the interplanetary zeitgeist with a direct line to God. Circling spheres of connecting influences, we laughed, pranced, and danced the loneliness away, the music more drug than any downtown score. You knew how to drive and ride horses. I knew how to hitchhike from airports and marinas. We compared notes, jets to boats. You hustled the different ride on a tidal wave of regret and we never met again. Though sometimes you come to me in dreams and ask me for the missing lyric to a song you are trying to sing for the angels, and still you are beautiful, 
exactly as then, but more radiant and shiny and happy. I ask if there are horses up there and if you ride them and you laugh so sweetly. Come and see, you tell me. Later, I say. I will come later. Thank you, Betty. We've outlasted a lot of people. I think both you and I are both kind of surprised to still be be here out of, out of all the people that we've known. But there's, <laughs> a, there's a certain point where, you know, I look around and I say, geez, you know, I actually know more dead people than living ones. Well, and again, it's the job often of the artist, the musician, the writer, the visual artist to channel what has come before, what has influenced, what has impacted, positive or negative, to carry the torch, to carry on, to not give up, to not be the one that jumps out the fifth yeah, floor window. Or, or implodes with drugs, you know. Yeah. To be the survivors so that we can positively still influence the living and ultimately speak for the dead before that is what we will ultimately become. So how did this, how did this play into raising three boys? <laughs> you know, so, so you have all these experiences, you've filtered it and, and redirected it or directed it the way you did, which seems pretty positive to me. And then you have, now you have the responsibility of three kids. Were you conscious about how, you know, hey, I'm going to uh, take these experiences and be very mature and explain to them how these things work? Or were you trying to protect them from some of these worlds? Or, or how do you approach that? Uh, it's on a, what they're ready to have and when, of course. But I always gave young people credit for a certain amount of intelligence. I, I, I maybe tackle complicated subjects, but I would do it in a very simple and direct way. Uh, on the on the level that they were up for my primary focus was just without freaking out making sure they were safe you know but without but I, not the current way that that's expressed by parenting in 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 this world because part of keep, having them be safe is them being equipped with knowledge and able to navigate a very complicated and minefield strewn world that we live in and, and having uh, stamina and having resilience and a base to proceed from. And then in terms of having the space to be themselves, to grow and develop and become whoever the hell that is, getting out of the way, not actually putting a whole lot of anything there. You know, there's structure, there, here is a safe home to be in, there is food to eat, there is a structure, there is school to go to. It's, they're not, it's not the greatest school in the world, but they're not gonna kill you there either. And, uh, you know, everything that you need that I can uh, afford or make available to you, you have these resources and you use them or not as you care to. What's interesting to me, Bibi, is that in this generational thing of being born unto two artists and then yourself growing three artists, usually kids rebel against what their parents were. Like if their parents were straight, they're going to become a musician. They're going to become right. an artist. They're going to run away. But you have this, this generational artistic urge, need, mandate that has been passed through the yeah, bloodline. mostly uh, whenever anyone says, how do you do that? I, my biggest advice is to get out of the way. <laughs> like the worst thing you could do is insist that anybody uh, practice or, you know, rehearse. You know, again, I didn't raise my kids structureless or without any kind of authority or, or structure. But it didn't dominate who they were as people or their personal choices. They got to pick their friends, they got to pick their clothes, they get to keep their room how they ever they want to do, they get to do what they like with their things. So there's 
little interference with that. On the other hand, uh, when you're interacting out here in, in, in the group, you, you have to respect the, the rights of others. That's going to be very much enforced and insisted upon. What's going on with the Al Hansen archives, of which there are rooms and boxes upon closets, upon a mysterious amount of material that I know you and Sean have, uh, are sitting on and really need to find a home other than yeah, in your well, closet. Yeah, well, one of the neat things about this whole lockdown thing is Sean being here instead of having to go down and work in the city for the man nine to five, Monday through Friday. He's been here and working from home at his job, but also predominantly here. And that's given us a lot of time to, you know, work on the archive. And we've actually been going at it. One of the difficulties with it is that it's so many different kinds of media. It's photographs, it's negatives, it's slides, it's cassette tapes, it's hi it's the video, it's, you know, it's just all these, it's texts, it's artworks. It, there's so many, it's ephemera. There's so many different parts to it. Oh, I understand. Honey, you, you, you know how that goes. <laughs> you know how that goes. But trust me, once the burden of the articulation can then find yeah. a home where it can be housed, and perhaps Cologne, this is not always this country. It's not always the place you work, you created, you were born that appreciates what you do, which is why we have to go to Europe so often, which is That's why, why as Al musicians, we Kinson go to Europe. Which died is why in Europe because he was living there, because he couldn't make a living in the United States as an artist, but he could in Europe. And it's basically, as it has been for most of the more than 100 years, the way it's been for avant-garde artists, musicians, creators, writers of, of any sort. It's that Europe had, for some reason, a, because it's older and more intelligent, a deeper appreciation for us, yeah, weirdos like us. You were in uh, one of his performances at Howl Gallery. My father wrote a piece called Car Bibby. The scores that are each, you get like a dozen cars. And each car has a list of things to do, like slam the door and honk the horn, things like that. But everybody's got a different, every, each car has a different list and people can do however they want to do that. For people that don't know who might be younger and have no idea exactly what Fluxus represents, and, and some of the participants, I mean, Yoko Ono was participating sure. in some of the performances. Just give us a brief summary of the outlandish, ridiculous, and liberating nature of Fluxus. I don't even know if there can be oh, a description beyond one that. One of Go the ahead. things that's the most difficult about Fluxus is that nobody can wrap their brains around what the hell it is. But there are some hallmarks of it. Number one is it's an art of idea. It's about, it's actually an art of ideas. And it's also seen as something that takes place above, around, and beyond the marketplace. It's almost impossible to put a price tag on any of this stuff. It's like, wait, you know, how do you do that? You know, because so little of it has to do even with objects. Uh, you know, there are events, ideas, performances, but there are objects and there are collections and, and there are the individual personal work of the different artists who were also Fluxus artists, whether that work is seen as being Fluxus or not. DIY was very important. You don't need to have in order to do. You do. <laughs> and you make do with whatever you have to hand. And, and however that is, whatever your limitations are, you accept it, you embrace it. And in that, we, you know, we see punk rock. You know, that's where punk came from. And that's where uh, even, and no wave took beyond that. But that idea of you don't need, you don't need this, that, or the other sort of uh, rules and setup and money and access in order to create. You take whatever you got, you take 
my dad took cigarette butts from the ashtrays or off the streets and made beautiful art with it, you know, or magic. He was broke. He didn't have the money. What are you going to do? It's not about satisfying a market design. It's not about designing for a market. It's often something you cannot buy. Therefore, you cannot put a price tag on it. Therefore, it's confusing, which means basically irrationally, outrageously, in a liberating way, almost anything. Sure, well, or, or go back further to Duchamp, anything could be considered art if the, if the artist is stating it. So you have things like John Cage liked the idea, as did uh, Duchamp, of taking ego out of the thing, because taking out my idea of well, how I think this would be really good or, or really uh, a valuable thing and introduce some element of chance or random quality to it. So you have Burroughs doing the cut-ups where he would just take all the sentences and then cut them up and, and rearrange them. My father used to do something called media poems where uh, he would just cut headlines from newspapers and columns and then throw them in the bag, shake them up, and then pull them out one by one and paste them up and make a poem in this way. So when you're done, you actually have this intermedia thing because what you have is a poem, but you also have this visual object. So it's concrete poetry and then it's visual. And, and this idea of not having limitations between areas like, oh, this is this and this is this and you know, sort of smooshing them all together. This is another idea of happenings and fluxes and that whole neo dada period of the 50s and early 60s in New York uh, that also spills over into pop. They, the, the idea being that instead of seeing yourself as opposed to another artist, making it a hallmark in, in fluxes particularly of naming your artworks after other art, artists and when you're performing, uh, let's say you're, you're asked to do a performance of your performance art, that you would perform other people's performance art as well. You wouldn't just do your own. I mean, the living artist is the ultimate and optimum art object. And with that, I have to say, this has been the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and one of my favorite pieces of creative living art, Phoebe Hansen. Thank Thanks, you, guys. It was wonderful to hang out with you, Lydia. Thank you for everything, Likewise. always, ever, and forever. <laughs>